Welcome, Gary Bourne. Welcome, my uh, dear uh, friends. We are here again with the Arbitration Channel and Hard Talk. Uh, this time to talk with another star of international arbitration, Mr. Gary Bourne, uh, without his traditional hair. Uh, and uh, we are going to, uh, to make this interview, Gary, in order to show to our students something important about the international environment of, uh, of, of arbitration. So uh, everybody knows you uh, here in Brazil. And uh, I have here, as I told you, 14 pages, very long pages. And uh, I, I had a professor in, uh, in Sao Paulo that used to say that when a person is well known, uh, do not lose your time making the, a long introduction uh, because you're, you're going to lose your time and uh, the time of your audience. So uh, what I want to say about Gary Bourne uh, is that he is the most important partner of uh, uh, Wilmer Hale most important partner because he is in charge of the arbitration group, arbitration team of this uh, this important law office. So uh, he is in charge of 70, per, uh, 70 persons in his office in order to coordinate the arbitration team. And uh, uh, Gary Bourne uh, is known because his practice of arbitrator and, law, uh, law, uh, and uh, lawyer in arbitrations and also because of the several courses um, he had in uh, several universities, um, Harvard Law School, Stanford, uh, Gallen University, uh, Singapore University, University of Peking, uh, Tsinghua University, Georgetown, uh, Virginia, and so on. So I'm not going to, to repeat this very long and uh, brilliant curriculum. And uh, I would like to begin our interview uh, right now. And uh, to make, uh, and I'm going to make uh, eventually one or two comments on uh, on the, the this discussion. And I would like to uh, to ask to Fabiana to uh, make the first uh, question of this interview. Fabiana. Thank you, Professor Camona. First of all, Professor Gary, thank you very much for being here with us. It is a great honor for us and for all the Brazilian arbitration community to hear you, you your views and advices today. So my first question is regarding arbitration in Brazil, actually. And we would really like to know what views, if any, have you been able to form about arbitration in Brazil? That's, a, that's an excellent question. In, in some ways, all the other speakers, Professor Kamona and, and the other participants today may be at least as well placed as myself to, to answer that. I think I'm the one person on this program who isn't qualified in Brazil and who doesn't speak Portuguese. Nonetheless, I'll, from a foreign perspective, an international perspective, let me try and answer. I think arbitration in Brazil over the last two, three decades has, like arbitration in a number of other important jurisdictions around the world, dramatically changed. It's changed to an attitude that I think, for the most part, is, is pro-arbitration. 1996 Act, the attitude in many cases of Brazilian courts, perhaps not all cases, but in many cases, the development of a very competent, very impressive Brazilian international arbitration community, both as arbitrators, a number of, of quite well-known Brazilian arbitrators, but also counsel in cases involving both Brazil, but, but also other jurisdictions. I think all of that has led to Brazil being quite an important force, not just economically, not just financially in, in South America, but, but more generally, but also an important force in international commercial arbitration. Obviously, international investment arbitration is perhaps a little bit different from a Brazilian perspective, but with respect to international commercial arbitration, I think Brazil is, is really one of the important jurisdictions on, on the world map today, which I don't believe one fairly could have said 20 or, or 25 years ago. I'd like to, to conclude that answer by noting that, that other jurisdictions around the world um, over that same time period, the last 25 or 30 years, have also made very important steps, I, I think in particular of of India and, and Singapore, to a lesser extent, perhaps the Russian Federation. But, but those jurisdictions have also, both through legislative enactments of 
the UNSATRAL model law and, and otherwise through the development of a pro-arbitration uh, judicial approach towards international arbitration through the development of um, an international arbitration legal community have, have done much the same same thing. It is a great benefit, not just to, to Brazilian companies, to, to South American companies, but to companies all around the world for Brazil to be playing such an important and constructive role in the resolution of international commercial disputes. Uh, uh, Jerry, we don't have here in Brazil, uh, in our law, a uh, division between international arbitration and domestic arbitration. Everything is mixed together. Do you think it helps? So I think if I understand the question, is it is it desirable on the one hand or undesirable on, on the other hand to have a, a unitary statute that applies equally to both domestic and to international arbitration. The UNCTRA model law, of course, adopts the, a different approach. Um, the UNCTRA model law distinguishes international commercial arbitration from other types of arbitration. It applies only to international commercial arbitration. It doesn't, by its terms, applied to domestic arbitration. My own view is that in general, it makes more sense to have a standalone statute devoted only to international arbitration. I say that because some of the policy considerations that apply in the context of international arbitration differ from those in domestic arbitration. The most obvious of those differences is, of course, the, the New York Convention, the 1958. United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. That imposes obligations on states with respect to international arbitration that don't apply to domestic arbitration. And therefore, there, there's an important reason to, to at least potentially treat the two differently. Now, one might say, well, we want to adopt the same rules for domestic arbitration as we do for international arbitration, which in principle is uh, an acceptable, in fact, a, a desirable approach, but I think it is undesirable to link the fate of those two types of arbitration, international and domestic arbitration, because circumstances may arise, legislative policies, decisions with respect to, to applicable law, other considerations that lead one to adopt views towards domestic arbitration that don't make sense in light of treaty obligations under the New York Convention and, and otherwise, and also that may not make sense in light of the special characteristics of, of international arbitration involving, as it does, not just purely domestic Brazilian issues, but also considerations of foreign law, considerations of international public policy and the like. And so, although I don't think that it is a, a fatal error to, to combine the two types of arbitration in a single legislative framework, I think it would be preferable following the, the UNCTRA model law example to have separate legislative regimes for each. And Professor, um, just out of curiosity, have you ever had the opportunity of participating in arbitrations here or in proceedings in which the applicable law was the Brazilian law? Very frequently. I'm participating in the moment in a Sao Paulo seated arbitration conducted primarily um, through virtual technology where the applicable law is, is um, Brazilian and the language of the arbitration is uh, Portuguese. I'm doing my best to keep up. I should also say, I've had, I should also say that I've had the pleasure of, of working with Brazilian lawyers, law firms, not just in that case, but in a number of, of other uh, cases over the years, over in particular the last five years, which have either been um, Brazil seated, typically Sao Paulo, um, or had some connection to, to Brazil or Brazilian law. Were this good experiences? Could you please tell us a bit about, a little bit about your experience? In, in each case, I found the, the tribunal um, the arbitral tribunal to, to be excellent. I found it um, both professional um, and, and highly competent. I found the, the in, in, in most of these cases, they were 
they were ICC, International Chamber of Commerce arbitrations. I found the, the administration, the case administration and supervision by the arbitral institution um, to, to, to be excellent. So um, my, my answer is, is that in those respects, yes, they were, they were quite positive. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now, Sergio. Hi, Gary. I also thank you for making yourself available. It's such a great honor to have you with us and to interview you. When you come to Brazil to work in our arbitrations, we learn with you, so we, we really thank you for that. I have two questions related to your personal experience. Uh, the first one being, can you recall any arbitration that made a particular impression on you or had a marked effect on your career? I suppose, I suppose um, every lawyer has um, important cases, landmark cases that, that influenced them. For me, in many ways, the, the most important arbitration was the first arbitration. It's a little bit like one's first girlfriend or boyfriend, as, as the case may be. It was the Rainbow Warrior arbitration where my firm, which ordinarily represents companies, entrepreneurs, instead represented an NGO, uh, Greenpeace, an environmental protest group, in an arbitration against the Republic of France. The arbitration unusually took place pursuant to a compromis, a, a arbitration agreement concluded after a dispute had arisen. And the dispute in this case involved the the French Republic's unfortunate uh, sinking of the Rainbow Warrior as it sat in a peaceful harbor, Auckland Harbor in New Zealand. The arbitration concerned the compensation that would be paid by France to, to Greenpeace. And the arbitration was, was conducted smoothly, efficiently. It produced an award, which has been publicly reported in, in favor of Greenpeace. For me, an arbitration of, of that sort really opened up my eyes to the possibilities of arbitration as a means of dispute resolution. It was a highly sensitive issue, highly political in, in France, also in a sense political, if unfortunate, on an international plane, a, a matter of, of intense personal importance to, to Greenpeace um, personnel, one of whom tragically died in, in the attack, um, a, a subject which would not ordinarily be proper for, for dispute resolution in, in national courts. And yet the parties cooperatively conducted an arbitration process aimed at putting behind them an unhappy chapter in, in both their, their histories. For me, that arbitration really did symbolize the possibilities in, in the future of resolving a, a wide range of, of disputes by, by arbitration, a means by which parties who were unable otherwise to obtain justice, who wanted to, in good faith, resolve a dispute using the arbitral process exactly to do so. In a sense, the second arbitration, I mentioned that there were two uh, quite important arbitrations in, in um, the, the recent the recent decades of, of my experience, the second arbitration was the so-called ABA arbitration. You can actually, instead of listening to me talk about it, you can actually watch it. It's on YouTube, ABA, A-B-Y-E-I arbitration, and you can add my name or permanent court of arbitration. It too was an arbitration of a dispute which seemed incapable of, of being resolved. It was a dispute between what was effectively North Sudan and, and South Sudan slightly before the ultimate independence of, of South Sudan. And the issue put simply in the ABA arbitration was the character of the territory that lay between North and, and South Sudan and to which one of those two countries, that territory, the so-called ABA area would, would belong. It was a fast track arbitration conducted in, in less than a year, which produced a, a lengthy award that made an important step contributing towards uh, peace in a region where peace is an extremely rare commodity. Again, for me, it showed the possibilities of 
arbitration as a means of resolving even the most intractable international disputes. That's that's interesting, Gary, that you mentioned this case because when we were preparing ourselves for this interview, we all watched uh, uh, you presenting the oral arguments in this case, and that's fantastic. You're pretty humble in starting the oral arguments, taking all the team and, and uh, making reference to all your colleagues who, who made it possible. Uh, the, the second question that I have related to your personal experience is, uh, more generally, are there any other important events or episodes that have had an important impact on you and that you'd like to share with us? So a couple of things. One, um, I, I have over the last several years worked with the Asian Development Bank in um, legal reform projects in the South Pacific Islands. Islands like Fiji, Palau, Tonga, and others, uh, Papua New Guinea, um, Timor-Leste. And the object of the Asian Development Bank's legal reform project was to assist these countries in developing their legal infrastructure, in particular for foreign trade and investment. And the central plank of that project was encouraging these states, assisting these states in ratifying the New York Convention on the one hand and adopting the Institral Model Law on the other hand, speaking with both government representatives, ministers of justice and, and other responsible government authorities, as well as private enterprise and the legal communities in these jurisdictions was, was, a, was a very rewarding experience and equally Satisfying was to, to see the results of the Asian Development Bank's projects. A number of the states in the region either ratified the New York Convention or adopted some version of the UNCTRA model law, or in some cases did, did both. That was, in my view, a, a very important contribution. It has assisted the New York Convention in becoming a, a global, essentially a universal constitutional charter for international commercial arbitration, making it virtually universal all, all around the world. Only a, a, a very few countries, um, North Korea, for example, not being party to, to the, the New York Convention. The, the, the second part of my answer, though, it goes in a, in a slightly different um, direction because it, it is, of course, important to think about the big cases, the important cases, like like the ones that I've mentioned, the important experiences. But I think my advice to, to younger lawyers is that every case is important. Every client is important. Every appearance in front of a, a tribunal, every interaction with a client or colleagues is important. Every potential new matter that comes to you and you're, you're seeking to persuade the client to hire you, every interaction of, of that nature is is also important. You, you only get one chance at, at this career. You don't get to, to replay things or to, to reset the, the game, even if technology makes us think sometimes we could. And I, I think my most important piece of advice is to make every one of those opportunities, whether you think it's the most important or suspect it may be the least important, make every one of them count because in reality, they are all critically important. You never know where one case, one relationship, one appearance will ultimately lead you and doing your very best on every occasion is in any event an absolute positive. It's something that you should always do. Gary, you uh, you mentioned uh, two in these two examples, uh, two cases involving states. But well, one, uh, uh, the Sudanese case, uh, probably w would be classified as a public arbitration, and the other, France and uh, and Greenpeace, perhaps uh, public and and private arbitration. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly. But here in Brazil, we have a different phenomenon. We are uh, using domestic arbitration, commercial arbitration, involving the state. Uh, the state and its companies. Uh, do you think it is a good tendency uh, to use commercial arbitration involving the state? 
I do. And in many ways, I think that arbitration is especially well suited for disputes in, involving the state. And I think it's for a simple reason that has to do fundamentally with the rule of law. It is, of course, a basic proposition of the rule of law, both internationally and in all jurisdictions, that the judge should be independent and impartial. The decision maker should be independent and impartial. In cases involving the state, where judges, of course, are appointed by the state, that is, by its very nature, difficult. It is impossible, in some sense, for the judge to be independent in the way that she or he could be in other cases involving only private parties. Arbitration, of course, permits one to escape from that dilemma, the dilemma of a judge appointed by and ultimately compensated, perhaps removed by only one of the two litigants before it. And that is arbitration, arbitration where the parties together choose the arbitral tribunal, either through agreement or through some mechanism where the choice is made by an entirely independent institution. In my view, that provides an entirely level playing field where no doubts, legitimate or otherwise, can be raised with respect to the independence and impartiality of the decision maker. It, it is not, therefore, coincidental that all throughout history, when disputes have involved states, very frequently arbitration has been used as the mechanism for resolving those disputes as opposed to, to national courts doing so. Good examples include, for example, Jay's Treaty, one of the essential steps for the United States to become an independent nation from Great Britain, included within it an arbitral mechanism by which claims of both British and US creditors against one another would be resolved through arbitration and claims against their respective states also would be resolved by arbitration. Claim settlement um, processes in other contexts, whether in Latin America, in the context of uh, European um, affairs have also used very similar mechanisms. Obviously, investor state arbitration is precisely along the same lines with more than 3,000 different bilateral investment treaties involving almost every country, not, not every country, as you know, in Brazil, um, provides an a, a, um, example of arbitration being used to, to resolve disputes between states. And I think that is, is both desirable and, and, in a sense, necessary to, to really provide uh, the rule of law in disputes with, with states and state entities. So now it's uh, Gustavo's turn. Professor Born, I also must say that it's a great honor to have you here. Thanks for being available to talk to us today. Uh, while, while answering Sergio's second question, you've mentioned a topic that I would like to address two questions to you. The, the topic here is advice to young counsel. My first question would be, do you believe that counsel's engagement in thought leadership, which means the practice of developing important new ways of thinking that influence others is critical in international arbitration? I think it's certainly very important. Um, I think, I think from both a pragmatic, practical uh, perspective, but, but also um, a more fundamental perspective, lawyers participating in what's sometimes called thought leadership, which in earlier eras was simply called commentary or academic writing, plays a, a very important role in, in a variety of ways. Um, from a pragmatic perspective, law is, is competitive. Clients have their choice of what law firm, what lawyer to, to represent them, both in arbitration and in other matters. The legal profession is not particularly capital intensive. You don't build factories, you don't develop roads, you don't bore mines or build off-sea um, oil platforms. Instead, the lawyer's tools are not capital intensive, but rather 
in a sense, labor intensive in the sense that what the lawyer is looked to for is her or his knowledge and judgment experience. And a critical element of that knowledge, that experience is playing a role in thought leadership, thinking creatively about the legal system as it exists today, about how it has flaws that could be improved, how different types of remedies might improve either international arbitration or international debt restructuring or intellectual property licensing, whatever one's particular practice area may be. Playing an important role in understanding the legal system so that one can comment on it and then commenting on it, engaging in the debate of ideas about what the law is, how it should be changed, what the consequences of different changes might be, I believe is very important pragmatically because it distinguishes a lawyer that does it from those many lawyers who, who do not do it. It provides a network of contacts that give you access to clients, that give you contact with potential arbitrators, potential co-counsel and, and the like. And, and so I think from, from a very, in a sense, selfish short-term view, it is important to, to play a role in, in thought leadership because of the added engagement in the community, the greater access to clients and business that one will have as, as a result. More fundamentally though, I think one gets much more out of the practice of law if it isn't just about, about making money, about winning this case or, or another case. Instead, it is about making the law your, your passion, making it in a true sense your profession, not just your job or your occupation. And in order to do that, I think my own personal view is that one needs really to understand the legal system, understand all aspects of it. When you, when you represent a client in a case, it's a little bit sometimes like looking through a, a keyhole. You see the world through the lens of that dispute and you focus very intently on each of the tiny details of that dispute. In many ways though, you never take a step back and look at the entire landscape of international arbitration, if that's what you do, or intellectual property or M&A transactions, if, if those are the things that you, you do. I think taking that step back, which is what thought leadership or academic commentary requires you to do, adds immeasurably to your enjoyment of the field, to the fulfillment that you will get from practicing law. And again, pragmatically, it will also make you a, a better lawyer, a much better lawyer in representing your clients in those individual keyhole cases. Very interesting, Professor. Thank you. It's really uh, um, an amazing, amazing advice. And my second question would be, what are your views of counsel's specialization in international arbitration? For example, to specialize in post m a disputes or construction arbitration and so on. So this, this advice may, may come as a little bit perhaps of, of a surprise. Um, I am a little skeptical about over specialization. Now, given how much I've specialized in international arbitration, that may sound a little bit anomalous or, or surprising. But in addition to doing international arbitration, I've also always had a very keen interest in international litigation or private international law, as it's often called, carried out in, in national courts, whether in, in the United States or elsewhere. Equally, as, as the ABA and the Greenpeace cases suggest, I've I've had a keen interest in, in international law, public international law in, in particular, and therefore have, in, in a sense, it's, it's not so much that one shouldn't specialize, it's just one shouldn't specialize in only one thing. Um, rather, one ought to have multiple specialties, ought to love multiple aspects of, of the law. And as a consequence, I would hesitate to tell someone to to specialize only in M&A arbitration or even only in international or domestic arbitration. I would 
urge them to have a, a broader focus. Part of the reason is, is again, pragmatic. Um, M&A arbitration may, may fall on hard times for a couple of years if the number of deals that are concluded in a particular financial cycle um, goes down significantly. The, the same is, is true for construction. If, if no, no construction projects are undertaken, then you won't have too many construction disputes. And, and therefore, I think it is wise pragmatically, it's sensible pragmatically to specialize in several different things instead of just one. But more fundamentally, in a sense, going back to, to the thoughts in my, my previous answer, I think one gets a lot more out of law and indeed puts a lot more into law if one knows about several different practice areas. It gives you a chance to transplant what you've learned in one area to another area where it may at first not seem like those lessons directly apply, but where on closer inspection, you actually can put to very good use techniques from one field in a, a different field. That's true both in different types of arbitration insurance arbitration, learning, for example, from M&A arbitration or vice versa, but also true in different fields of practice. Things that you learn from public international law may turn out to have a quite direct relevance to international commercial arbitration in some cases. So uh, now uh, the subject is uh, navigating the client, uh, Jean Marcel. Thank you, Professor Carmona, and thank you, Professor Bourne. It's really a pleasure for us to have you here today. Thank you. And, uh, it's a pleasure because we meet during an international arbitration conference at UPenn a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken, in 2017, uh, in which you were the, the keynote. So it's really a, a pleasure to have here uh, this interview with you today. And uh, as mentioned by Professor Carmona, and you have just mentioned in the previous questions about the importance of meeting clients' expectations. So basically what I would like to ask you is how should counsel balance the expectations from clients of being cost efficient and having a thorough understanding of their case? So that's a that's a good question, and it's one that um, both becomes more more relevant in a sense, and also in another sense more difficult in in the past um, five years, ten years perhaps. Clients around the world in different industries have have become increasingly cost conscious. They have begun to or um, increase the extent to which they impose financial constraints on on lawyers and at the end of the day that's that's a choice obviously that that clients um, are free to make indeed they must make it out of the sense of responsibility to to their shareholders as as counsel those kinds of constraints very limited budgets fixed fixed fees or or caps on on um, the amount that one can charge in a case have an, have an inevitable impact on the quality of one's work. You, you can't pay for um, a, a, a SEAT or a FIAT on the one hand and expect to get a Bentley or a Rolls Royce on, on the other hand. And clients may very well be quite happy with a FIAT and not care very much for, for Rolls Royces. For, for counsel, ultimately, the client's decision about financial constraints is is dispositive and one of the more difficult the less pleasant aspects of counsel's relationship with a client is attempting to to deal with uh, financial constraints of of that sort because they do inevitably affect both the quality of what counsel does and therefore her or his reputation and also the the ability of counsel really to, to contribute to, to the client's cause. Um, lawyers inevitably argue that they need more money, they need more time. Um, clients frequently push back on that. A lawyer has a responsibility ultimately to, to push very hard for adequate financial resources to, to do a case in, in a proper manner. In, in some instances, 
uh, clients' representatives focus very much on one particular um, line item in their budget, may be insistent that only so much money can, can be spent on this case, even if in reality, limiting what counsel can do in that case is not at all in the client's best interest because it exposes the client to the risk of significantly larger financial losses or, or other losses. It's counsel's obligation in those circumstances to, to push back as, as best she or, or he can. There may be cases where a client insists on such dramatically limited um, budgetary constraints that counsel can't in good conscience go forward professionally. The case is simply too complicated or too difficult to, to be done properly, to be done professionally on the basis that the client requests. On the other hand, lawyers have an obligation as well to, to be maximally efficient. And that's one of the reasons, going back to one of my previous answers, that it really does pay for a lawyer to know his or, or her field quite quite well. One in those circumstances then doesn't need to reinvent the wheel to start over with new research every time an issue comes up. But at the end of the day, clients have the final say in how much money can be spent on a particular case. And as a consequence, how well a lawyer does in, in a particular case and ultimately whether the client wins or loses. I see. So if a certain client reached out to you about going to arbitration or rather going to a litigation, what basically can you tell clients who are weighing the pros and cons of arbitration versus litigation? Well, every case is, is dependent on, on its own facts. Um, in, in many cases, there may be no choice in the sense that there may be no arbitration clause and thus arbitration is, is not likely to be a realistic option. Alternatively, there may be an arbitration clause that obligates one to, to go to arbitration as opposed to courts. If, if in unusual cases, a client has a choice or if a client wants to propose waiving an arbitration clause or entering into a compromis, one has to take into account all the circumstances of particular cases in deciding which, to, which course, litigation or arbitration, to, to recommend. Often, litigation um, is, is difficult to agree upon because it inevitably involves litigation in a particular national court. Often the home court of one of the two parties. And in virtually all cases, neither party is particularly eager or willing to litigate in the home jurisdiction of its, of its counterparty. Um, and as, as a consequence, um, litigation may well not be a, a, a potential alternative. With respect to cost, um, arbitration, frequently is less costly than litigation, but there certainly can be exceptions. It's less costly because it almost always does not involve layers of appeals. It is a, a single proceeding without the possibility of appellate review, only very limited review in an annulment mechanism. And in addition, there typically are not disputes about recognition of foreign judgments with respect to arbitration. The New York Convention makes arbitral awards relatively easy to enforce all around around the world. The party's ability to select arbitrators um, often inclines them and inclines counsel who are evaluating the options towards arbitration because it lets one choose a tribunal that is genuinely expert in the subject matter of the party's dispute. I sometimes refer to what I call the six E's of arbitration, which in a sense go to the question of what type of dispute resolution should be recommended to a client. Obviously, everything depends on the facts of individual relationships, individual disputes. But in principle, the six E's provide that arbitration is ordinarily preferable because it's more expeditious, more efficient, more expert, more even-handed, more enforceable. And these days in the age of COVID-19, more electronic. And I won't spend much time talking about each one of those six E's, but let me say a word briefly about each one. I've already mentioned why 
arbitration tends to be both more expeditious, only one, one layer of, of review by way of annulment, not multiple layers of appeal, but also the fast track arbitration mechanisms that many institutions have adopted for smaller value disputes. Because arbitration is more expeditious, it also tends to be more efficient. Time is money and thus the less time you spend in layers of appeal, the more likely it is that you will ultimately spend less money in, in total. Arbitration is more expert because instead of having a one size fits all judge randomly assigned to the party's dispute, you have a tribunal picked for its expertise in a particular subject matter. Arbitration is more even handed because the tribunal is truly international selected by the parties, not one or the other party's home, home courts. Arbitration is more enforceable for reasons that we've already touched on because of the New York Convention, which provides a sort of enforceability premium for both international arbitration agreements and arbitral awards. And finally, in these days of the pandemic, arbitration is more electronic. The arbitration that I mentioned previously seated in Sao Paulo that I'm participating in was actually going forward just at the very time that, that international travel began to, to be interrupted. It was going forward in, in Sao Paulo. And instead, the tribunal canceled the remainder of the hearing and ordered that the proceedings continue in a virtual, in a remote format, which was done quite successfully. Other arbitral institutions and other arbitral tribunals have done exactly the same thing over the past year, the past 13 months. And in contrast, national courts in many countries have found it difficult to maintain the, the pace, the quality of justice that are obtained through, through their dispute resolution mechanisms. Arbitration has been the exact opposite. And so with those six E's in mind, I think in many cases, one will recommend to a client arbitration as opposed to litigation, if that's a viable possibility. Nonetheless, there can be, in some circumstances, exceptions. João, uh, perhaps uh, it would be uh, wise to uh, suggest Gary Bourne uh, to recommend uh, uh, his clients to come to Brazil and make arbitration here in our place. It, it will cost uh, six or seven times less than what it costs in the UK or in the US. So it's very convenient. <laughs> Think about arbitration it. in Brazil. Arbitration in Brazil is 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 unequivocally a good thing. I have no hesitation in recommending it. Good. Politically correct your answer. Good. Thank you very much. Now, Fabi, again about uh, what do you have to say about navigating culture, Fabiana? Thank you. Well, Professor, you, your specialization is international arbitration, and you made quite clear for us in your previous answers that respect, responsibility, justice, and peacemaking are big values for you. And also, these are quite important when navigating different cultures. So my question is, in your experience as counsel, how do you navigate different jurisdictions and cultures in, our, in your arbitration strategy? It's an excellent, um, excellent question, and it's one that comes up in almost every international arbitration. By definition, international arbitrations involve parties from from different jurisdictions, and therefore, in most cases, different cultures. Sometimes, radically different different cultures. And um, it's one thing to have an arbitration between a U.S. and a Canadian party, or a French and a Belgian party. It's something else to have an arbitration between a Brazilian and a Singaporean party or a Japanese and a U.S. or a Mexican party. I think the, the, there, then there is no correct or, or right answer to the question of how does one navigate those inevitable cultural differences. I think, I think a couple guidelines are, are important, though one is it's absolutely essential to, to keep a, an open mind, not to, to bring your cultural predispositions with you, not to make assumptions about what the other side is, is thinking or what your, your, your co-arbitrators on the tribunal are, are, are thinking based upon what your own culture would, would suggest. I also think it's, it's critical always to try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. How would 
you react if the mere image had been said to you as you or one of your colleagues just said to to from a, a different culture no no culture has a monopoly in international affairs whether arbitration or otherwise on proper behavior on correct answers on the wisest or most efficient solution in international arbitration what one looks for is the the most pragmatic the most fair the most just solution to both procedural and ultimately substantive questions no litigation system whether it's common law or civil law no culture whether it's uh, portuguese or english or chinese has a monopoly on pragmatism or wisdom or, or justice and it's the arbitral tribunal's mandate assisted by counsel for the parties to in fact come up with that bridge between differing cultures between differing legal systems Perfect. and uh, sergio what about the risk of annulment our next topic thanks professor carmona uh, the next talk is quite sensitive. Uh, as lawyers, we, we often find ourselves in the position of uh, representing clients in either challenging an award or objecting to it. So uh, in, your experience, in your experience as counsel, how persuasive are the parties' claims on risks of annulment in the tribunal's decision-making? So in order to answer that question, I think one, one needs to start with, with um, sort of an objective question. How, how great are the risks of annulment, period? Put aside what an arbitral tribunal thinks or how, how that risk affects the tribunal's thinking. For the most part, the risks of annulment in international arbitration are quite limited. Obviously, annulments happen. But if you look at statistics from major jurisdictions around the world, the frequency of annulment is is quite low. There have been there have been quite quite careful studies done in a variety of jurisdictions: the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Switzerland, and the likelihood of of annulment is is below below ten percent, usually um, significantly below ten um, percent. And keep in mind as well that that's ten percent of those cases in which annulment is sought. Um, and in the vast majority of cases, annulment is not sought at all. So a, a 10 percent figure is is in fact um, dramatically or five or four percent figure, whatever one one takes, is in fact significantly overstated. Out of all arbitrations, I would I would guess that the likelihood of annulment of an award is is closer to one percent than than to just about any other other percent. That's hardly surprising in, in a sense. If one looks at the Institutional Model Law, Article 34, the grounds that are available for annulment are deliberately extremely limited. There's no appeal on questions of fact. There's no appeal on questions of law. Did the arbitral tribunal correctly apply the civil code or the applicable common law rule? None of, none of that is a, is a possibility. Instead, only objections based on, on jurisdiction on serious, and, and I do mean quite serious, um, procedural irregularities and either public policy or, or non-arbitrability, both of which are extremely limited. And non unsurprisingly, given those quite narrow statutory grounds for annulment, there are in practice very few um, annulments. How does that limited risk affect a, a tribunal? Tribunals, of course, don't ever want their awards to, to be annulled, and it is something that they have regard to. If there's an easy way to, to protect against the possibility of annulment, for example, with respect to procedural matters in particular, tribunals will, will often um, do that. If, if a party objects that it hasn't been permitted a sufficient opportunity to do one thing or another, tribunals may be um, inclined to, to give the party that possibility. This is sometimes referred to as due process paranoia, the notion that arbitral tribunals are paranoid about their awards being annulled or denied recognition for procedural errors or missteps. 
I'm not sure that tribunals actually are so paranoid about due process violations. In my experience, tribunals quite seriously want to ensure both parties have a full opportunity to be heard. They also want to, to ensure that the parties have confidence in the arbitral process. And a party, even if mistaken, feels strongly that, that it has been denied a procedural opportunity in the arbitration may not be as cooperative going forward. And thus where without prejudice to an opposing party, a tribunal can essentially cure the reason for an objection procedurally the, the tribunal, in my experience, may, may frequently uh, do so. Um, I don't think that tribunals shy from making difficult decisions because of concerns about annulment. I think their, their primary focus is on resolving the dispute correctly, properly between the parties, applying the proper view of the law the rule of law to the facts as as they determine them without without fear of uh, annulment um, entering into into their minds and I think that, that is as it as it should be the arbitral tribunal has a mandate to complete and if a national court rightly or wrongly subsequently annuls its award that that is for the national court to decide but the arbitral tribunal's focus should be on on completing its mandate as, as best that it can. Great, that's excellent. Thank you, Gary. Of course. And, and, and what about this uh, American thing of uh, manifest disregard of the law? Uh, do you think it is a risk for international arbitration or is something for uh, internal matters or domestic arbitration or something like, like this? That's an interesting, interesting question. And um, it, it's first, let me say, manifest disregard is, is a, a topic that's, that's hotly debated. Um, one finds um, legal commentaries, law review articles on it, blogs and, and the like. Every time a manifest disregard decision is, is handed down, there's, there's intense um, attention to it. Um, law professors endlessly debate the question, is there a doctrine of manifest disregard in U.S. arbitration law um, or isn't there? There was a U.S. Supreme Court decision in a case called Hall Street um, a decade ago or so that at least arguably eliminated um, the notion of manifest disregard both in domestic and, and international matters. Um, despite that intense interest, in, in, in a sense, the debate is um, a little exaggerated, if I can put it that way. Even if there is a doctrine called manifest disregard of law, it is extraordinarily narrow. It doesn't mean that you can annul an award because an arbitral tribunal made a mistake of law. It certainly doesn't mean you can annul an award because the tribunal made a mistake of fact. Um, even in its most expansive version, the doctrine only concerns mistakes of law, but it also only concerns a very narrow range of mistakes in law, specifically cases where an arbitral tribunal knew exactly that the law was A, but nonetheless deliberately applied not A as the law, where in a sense the tribunal intentionally refused to apply the law. And that, that is the limit of the manifest disregard um, doctrine, assuming that it exists. And there are a number of authorities that, that say that it, it doesn't exist. Unsurprisingly, there are virtually no cases that ever annul an award, do what the Americans call vacating an award on, on manifest disregard grounds. And thus, that, that's why I say that the debate is a little bit exaggerated because it, it takes a doctrine that has very little practical impact and focuses uh, considerable scholarly effort on it instead of on things that, that do actually matter in, in the real world. For what it's worth, my own personal view is that there should not be um, a doctrine of manifest disregard, um, that um, it adds a, a degree of uncertainty, a degree of delay to the arbitral process, um, which, is, which is undesirable. I certainly think parties should have the freedom to waive the possibility in advance of uh, manifest disregard review and 
um, in my view, many institutional arbitration rules um, do do just just that. Um, most countries in the world um, do not have a manifest disregard um, basis for annulment. There's no such basis, of course, in in the UNSA trial model law, um, and even the English Arbitration Act, which includes a mechanism for very limited legal review of a tribunal's findings, both permits waiver of that legal review um, and also limits it solely to important issues of, of English law. I don't think that's a good idea either, um, but like manifest disregard, it is of relatively limited practical importance. Uh, I have now I'm a, a little more confident uh, in uh, American arbitration. <laughs> Okay, so our last topic is oral advocacy and cross-examination. So, so uh, João Marçal. Thank you, Professor Carmona. So on the oral advocacy issue, Professor Bourne, what tips would you share with counsel doing oral arguments for the very first time? So the first time is always... Um, always the hardest, as, as they say. Um, and, and my advice, I think, will be a little bit contradictory. First, uh, you can never prepare enough. And knowing your case, knowing just as importantly your opponent's case is, is critically important. Um, you should never shortchange preparation. It's the most important thing. Second, even though preparation is, is so critically important, um, and even though you as a young lawyer will probably want to write out the script for what you say and in, in your early years of your career you should write out a script for what you will say don't read it um, there may be a temptation because you're nervous and you're worried that you will lose your train of thought that you will get confused that you will misspeak or that you'll miss an important point that that you should just read um, a prepared statement um, try your very best to avoid that temptation. It's understandable that one has that temptation, but a tribunal that's being read to will probably start to, to tune you out. Um, much better is to engage the tribunal, to look at them, to make eye contact with them, to see when they're with you, to see when they may be skeptical, to tailor what you say based on the feedback you get from their body languages from from the oral expressions on the different tribunals um, faces um, if if one must read and, and having having watched a lot of younger lawyers make their first arguments I I am aware that my my last piece of advice sometimes isn't isn't followed then make sure you practice so that it doesn't sound like you're reading make sure you practice so that that your script is is second nature to you ideally though you can a little bit like the Walt Disney's Dumbo, who flies first with a feather, but then realizes he can fly with without a feather. You'll learn that you can you can make a perfectly good opening or or cross examination with without a script. The not using a script is, I think, um, or not sticking to a script is perhaps the better way to put it. Is especially important in cross examination. Um, one must adjust to what the witness says, what her or his answers may be, just as one has to adjust one's argument depending on how the tribunal um, responds. Thank you, Professor Born. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, my colleague Gustavo has a, a question specifically on the cross-examination issue, maybe a $1 million question or millions and millions of dollar question. So Gustavo, you have the floor. Thanks, Raul. Professor, here it goes. So in line with the previous question, I would like to ask you, what, what advice would you give to counsel conducting cross-examination in international arbitration for the first time? And also, how can he or she master the art? So, I mean, that's a good question. Cross-examination is extraordinarily difficult. Um, it's difficult to practice it because you never know how a witness is, is going to, to respond. Um, there's that feeling of helplessness 
when you ask a question and get an answer that's exactly the opposite of what you were expecting or which is completely different from from what you were expecting one one way and as one gains experience with with cross examination one one learns to to anticipate these kinds of surprises and to to react to them um, one way to try to reduce the risk of surprise is to practice cross-examination with one of your colleagues. Have one of your colleagues read, read who's working on the file with you, read the, the witness statement and then play the role of the witness who, who you will be cross-examining. I think it's also always important um, to remember and, and counsel frequently forget this. Um, always remember the witness is a person in a sense, that seems ridiculous. Of course, the witness is a person, um, but often lawyers tend to associate the witness with, with the client, especially if, as in many cases is true, the witness is an employee or an officer of, of um, the corporate party um, in, in the arbitration. We always remember that the witness has, even if, even if representing a client, the witness has his or her own perspective on the case. They were at some meetings and not at other meetings. They wrote some letters or emails and not other letters and emails. They commented on some proposals, but not others. They have a very particular set of, of knowledge and experiences. And your questions have to try to take that into account, both, both defensively in the sense that you don't want to, you, you can't ask a witness about general aspects of the case, no matter how important, that they don't know anything about. But also, affirmatively, the witness may know things based on their particular knowledge and, and experience that haven't come out in the, the, the corporation for whom they works um, submissions in the arbitration. In that sense, the witness is the possibility to open up a new window and show new light on something that the other side may have preferred to keep in, in the dark. Um, always remember that cross-examination can, can never be perfect. Um, everybody makes mistakes in, in cross-examination. Everybody asks one question too many on some occasions and having established a, a, a very nice, if not perfect, um, set of propositions from a witness, they then ask that fatal last question that completely undoes all of the positive aspects that have, have gone before. Or alternatively, sometimes you fail to pursue a line of questioning which a, a witness's answer opened up and which on reflection you realize might have been very, very productive. Don't, don't criticize yourself too much for those kinds of mistakes and don't, don't be too nervous as you go through the cross-examination exercise about the mistakes that you might make, everyone makes mistakes in, in cross-examination. It's simply part of the beast. Good advice, good advice. You know, Gary, I, I'm not sure if our students know, will know who Dumbo is. Uh, probably we have to explain to them who is Dumbo, the elephant, the flying elephant, but it's not, it's not part of, of this new generation. <laughs> Very old. So, so Dumbo the elephant was a Walt Disney creature, an elephant with very large ears, who he discovered he could fly with the benefit of a feather given to him by a friend. And he was told by the friend that the feather was what enabled him to fly. Obviously, it wasn't. It was this baby elephant's extremely large ears, which enabled him in this children's cartoon to fly. When push came to shove, though, Dumbo realized that he didn't need the feather, that in fact, he could fly perfectly well in his own. And that's a little bit like all of you when you're doing your first opening, you can put your script aside and fly without it. Great, <laughs> thank you. So uh, before we close, uh, uh, 30 seconds to say goodbye and to salute our guests, please. Let's begin with Fabiana. Thank you, Professor. It was your advices were really priceless. We are such lucky people to hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana. 
Gustavo? Professor, amazing interview and such a unique opportunity to be here with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gustavo. João? João? So once again, thank you, Professor Bourne. It's really a pleasure to have here you today. I, I remind uh, Professor Burbank's class at UPenn talking about litigation, pros and cons of litigation or arbitration. And yo, Professor Warren <laughs> was indeed my student. So we, we talked several times about these pros and cons and it's quite an honor to have your, your questions and your opinions here with us today. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you very much, Joe. Sergio, the last but not the least. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Gary. It's such an honor for us to interview you and as part of the arbitration community, we are all glad to hear your wise words as always. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. No, Gary, thank you very much for being with us uh, for this hour. And uh, thank you very much for your patience, uh, answering to our questions and giving part of our, uh, your experience to our students. Uh, thank you very much. Even if in a distance, it is very good to see you again and to be with you again, okay? So it's next great. time, it's, it's gonna be in London or in US, you choose, okay? Or Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. Thank you so much, Sir Ramon. Thank you. Okay. See you, thank you very much. Okay.